Hello and welcome to episode 378 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert, as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm excited, Andy. I am going to watch England women's football team in the European final, hopefully to lift the trophy. So I'm buzzing about that because I bought the tickets for my family about a year ago before there was any hint that we'd get into the final. Of course, we were always going to be a favourite, so I'm buzzing. So if you've listened to this podcast and you're heading towards Wembley today then do keep an eye out you might see me wandering up Wembley way so just give me a wave and say hello and if you see someone that looks like Damien then that's very likely going to be Damien's brother Justin who's also going to the football it's a bit of a family outing isn't it yeah so if you ever see somebody who does look like me and they seem a bit rude or a bit vacant as to what's going on, then that is possibly my twin brother. And I have to warn people in my own life, so neighbours and people like that, that I have a twin that lives not far from me. And if they ever see him or see somebody like me who looks quite rude and ignores them, then it's it's not me, it's him. So I'm looking forward to that later today, if you're listening to this podcast on the day it's published. And hopefully we uh, manage to lift a trophy. Okay, so good luck to the England team this Sunday. And Damien, I hope you have a fantastic time there. So let's crack on with the podcast then. So Damien, what have we got coming up on the podcast this week? Yeah, so I'm going to do a section on the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds and actually the drawbacks of them. So the weaknesses of the Life Strategy Funds, because they're incredibly popular, but I released a video of how to invest a £1,000 on YouTube. So if you don't follow us on YouTube, make sure that you do because we produce a lot of content on YouTube, Instagram and other channels that doesn't necessarily appear on the podcast. So make sure you follow us on there. But one comment on that video about how to invest a thousand pounds was from somebody who was lamenting the fact they'd invested in Vanguard at the beginning of the year and now were sitting on a loss and wish they'd stayed in cash. So that sparked the piece I want to do today because it's important that people understand what they are investing in. And I'll explain why as well, because I know there are a lot of people out there that do pump the Vanguard funds and they have performed very well, but it's important to understand what's going on behind the curtain. And leading on from that, and actually it'll be the first piece I do this week, is about investment trust. So I want to pick up about the biases that exist in investment trusts and there are biases and again this is this theme that I'm taking on this week about getting people to understand what they actually are investing in and the final piece is something that you're going to do Andy which is quite an exciting development for consumers. Yeah that's right the FCA have announced this week a new consumer duty, which is an overarching principle and a set of rules that they've established for firms in the financial services industry must adhere to. And it's quite exciting for consumers. So I'm just going to go through that, what the rules are and what it may mean for consumers in the years to come. So investment trust then, Damien, what's this first piece? So back in episode 284, I did a piece on investment trust drawback. So go back and listen to that episode. That's your homework for this week. I always like to give people homework and also to highlight our back catalogue because our back catalogue is evergreen. We're always trying to make these shows evergreen. So there's plenty for you to go back and learn from. Now, in addition to that episode, listen to episode 214. I talked about the differences between unit trusts and investment trusts. So I'm going to just give you a brief overview just to give this piece some context I'm going to do today. Investment trusts are a form of fund effectively that you can invest in. You've got unit trust and you have ETFs, but you have investment trusts as well. Now, investment trusts work very much like a share. So they're effectively a company that invests and you can buy shares in that company. So it's run like a, a normal fund that you'd think of like a unit trust, but it's set up in a particular way. So like I say, it's run like a company. You can buy and sell shares in that investment trust, which is a key principle. So you can buy and sell those throughout the day. It isn't like unit trusts, which are priced once daily. You can actually buy and sell as and when you want. It means that the price of this share can deviate away from the underlying assets that the investment trust holds. Effectively, 
imagine a company that has a load of assets, the value of the shares can deviate from what it's actually holding and investing in. And that's because of supply and demand. So it's like any share that you have out there. If lots of people want to own it, then its price will go up. If lots of people don't want to own it, then its price will go down as people sell it. And obviously, there's going to be a link to the net asset value that's called NAV. So the underlying value of the holdings, but it can mean that the share price of an investment trust trades at something called a premium or at a discount to that net asset value. Now, unit trusts are different because their price tends to follow the actual value of the assets that the manager invests in. And that's because the manager can create units and destroy them effectively as people want their money in and out of the fund. So what happens with a unit trust, if people put money into the fund, they create units rather than shares, and they invest that money that people give them into the asset in accordance with the mandate of the fund. So when people want their money out, then it means that the fund manager will end up ultimately having to sell assets to be able to provide that money back to the investor and they actually therefore remove those units from existence and of course that's where you get this problem with unit trust when it comes to holding certain illiquid assets like property that if lots of people want to pull their money out of a unit trust if it invests in property then you can't sell part of a property or you can't sell property very quickly so you can end up having those funds gated where your money's stuck in there for a while until the situation eases so you don't have that sort of liquidity crunch whereas with investment trust they will just with investment trust that doesn't occur because people want their money back they just buy and sell the shares themselves it doesn't affect the underlying assets in the fund the manager's just doing what the manager's doing those investments trusts are effectively trading on the stock market people buy and sell them so that's one of the key differences of investment trusts and they generally speaking are cheaper than unit trust. If you look at the analysis out there, there's a bit of a discrepancy on it, but it is broadly true that they are cheaper than unit trust. And there are some other nuances which I'll come on to that make investment trust particularly attractive to investors. And in fact, more and more people are investing in investment trusts now than they were in the past because people are realizing that they exist because most pension funds would be investing in unit trust because that was the way that people had access to investing. Now, like I say, that's a, a very brief overview of some of the key differences. But go back to podcast 214 to hear the full list of how they differ. But one of the other key differences is that investment trusts can use something called gearing, which is effectively leverage. They can borrow money to invest. And what that means is that it can amplify the returns that you get. So if you have a good year, then it means that that returns can be amplified. The profits are amplified. But conversely, if you have a downturn and it can amplify the loss that's what happens if you use gearing. Now, podcast episode 284 was talking about the investment trust drawbacks. Listen to that episode. That was the key focal point of that episode, looking at how the gearing had hindered the performance of investment trusts back in 2020 when we had the sell-off with the pandemic. Now, I was looking at how they had performed year to date and was crunching some numbers and seeing, well, have investment trusts underperformed unit trusts given that the first half of 2022 is possibly one of the worst starts to a year. I think it is the worst start to a year, broadly speaking, for 50 years if you're an investor because bonds and equities both collapsed. Pretty much most assets tumbled in value and many entered bear markets. Now, when I looked at the numbers, yes, 2022 has panned out as you'd expect after listening to episode 284. If you take the UK all company sector in the unit trust universe. So that's the funds that invest in UK companies. As an average, so far in 2022, the average fund is down 9%. Now, if you look at the investment trust equivalent, that sector, it is down 20.58%. Now, that's not even close. That's a significant difference. And don't forget, UK equities has been one of the best asset classes in terms of equity markets so far in 2022. And that's partly because of some of the biases that we have, particularly in the FTSE 100, where we have exposure to things like oil and gas companies, which did perform very well in the first part of the year. So you can see that the numbers already show, just looking at that sector, that investment trust had underperformed. And of course, 
that is largely down to gearing, so that leverage. Now, interestingly, Interactive Investor have done another piece of research this year, which probably came off the back of the dismal start to the year and similar along my own thoughts about looking at the difference again. And they obviously did the original piece of research that I talked about a couple of years ago. And what is interesting, if you look at the numbers, I'm going to read out a few more sectors just to give you a flavor of what's been going on in 2022. So if you look at the global unit trust sector, then that is down 14.7% year to date. But the investment trust equivalent is down 23.3%. The UK smaller companies sector is down 24.6% in the unit trust universe, down almost a similar amount, 20.5% in the investment trust universe. If we go over to Europe, for example, well, in Europe, unit trusts win again. They're down 17% on average. That's the average European equity fund. The equivalent average European equity investment trust is down 26.2%. And so the research that they produced and the notes around it said, look, this is largely down to gearing. But what I wanted to talk to people about is to give them insight into having an inquiring mind and give them a lesson in research, really. So I looked at the numbers that they produced and started to let them wash over me. And then I picked out a couple of them. And one of them is that the performance year to date on the UK equity income funds is much closer between investment trusts and unit trusts than other sectors. So for unit trusts, it's 5.8% year to date. The equivalent sector in the investment trust universe is down 7.3%. So the difference is very close and much more marginal than the other sectors, like I mentioned. Also, if you look at the European smaller company sector, which I haven't mentioned on here yet, but if you look at the difference between the European smaller companies equivalent sectors in unit trust and investment trust, in the unit trust universe, it's down 25.9% year to date. In the investment trust universe, it's down 32.3%. So yet that narrative of investment trust underperforming continues. In the European European excluding UK sector. So we're not looking at smaller companies, but just normal companies. The European sector in the unit trust universe is down 17% and in the investment trust universe is down 26.2%. But what is interesting is if you look at the difference in performance between, say, the investment trust European smaller company sector and the investment trust European sector, the difference was only around about 6% in performance. Whereas if you look at the equivalent difference between the two unit trust universes, well, that difference was much more marked. It's eight, almost 9%. So you start looking at these numbers and start to realize there's something going on there. By that, I mean that when it comes to smaller companies, there are some slight anomalies. And this can actually be explained by the fact that investment trusts tend to have an overweight in mid to small cap companies. And so what we're seeing when we look at the numbers, and we'll put a link to the actual research piece that Interactive Investor did, so you can look at it if you wish. But what it suggests is that because investment trusts tend to have that bias, even when they're not trying to be in, say, the European smaller company sector, and they're just trying to be in the European sector, and similarly in the UK sectors, their funds tend to have that bias. So that is why the difference probably between the European investment trust and the European smaller companies investment trust performance was narrower than the equivalents in the unit trust universe, because a European investment trust is probably a quasi mid to small cap fund and almost could reside in the other sector anyway. You can see the same thing in the UK as well, because the UK smaller companies unit trust sector performance was down 24% versus down 12.9% for just the all companies sector. So the one that just invests in not just smaller companies, but the difference between the investment trust all companies was 26.6% compared to 20.5% for the investment trust smaller companies. It's not as big a difference. So there is a bias here and interactive investor, I think, missed spot in that. So I want to bring it to light so people realize, oh, if I pick an investment trust, then there could be an underlying bias to my portfolio. But also, they do tend to have a bias towards growth stocks. So in an environment where value has outperformed like we've had in 2022, then that also explains why 
investment trusts have underperformed. And I pointed out the UK equity income funds earlier. The difference was not that much between the investment trust and the unit trust by comparison. And I believe that's because the good dividend payers, so the companies that are going to be reliable dividend payers that would appear in either one of those sectors are going to be large companies that have good track records of paying dividends. So that doesn't mean smaller companies. And what is interesting, there is perhaps a parallel to be drawn with ethical funds. So anybody who's listened to previous shows of this podcast where I've talked about the bias on ethical funds, well, they tend to be small cap bias again, and they tend to have a almost tech exposure to them, which are growth stocks. So it's a similar thing. And they've done dismally in 2022, especially in the first, say, four or five months when things like commodities did well. So all the dirty stuff like oil and gas and fossil fuels rocketed in value, investing ethically hurt your portfolio. But of course, in previous years and over the long term, ethical funds have done quite well. But interestingly, if you look at the investment trust universe and the research backs this up, that over the long term, almost without exception, investment trusts outperform their unit trust equivalent. And that could be the actual fund within the same fund house, which I talk about on that episode 284, or it could just be on a sector level. So Interactive Investors research shows that investment trusts do significantly, is only one sector where it didn't happen, significantly outperform on average their unit trust peer group. And again, that is probably because of that mid to small cap exposure and growth stocks. They're the things that have done very, very well, say over the last decade or so, and certainly before 2022 and the back end of 2021. So the message is understand what you're investing in, what you're holding and what the inherent biases may be, because that will then explain why your funds or portfolio behaves the way it does, especially in a downturn. Okay, moving on to a piece that was inspired by somebody who made a comment on a video we made about how to invest a thousand pounds. Someone had invested in the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds and are now looking back and thinking, why didn't I sit in cash? So Damon, you're going to explain what the kind of issue is with Vanguard Life Strategy Funds at the moment. So this links quite nicely to the last piece about understanding what you own. Because as you say, we published a video about how to invest a thousand pounds. And there was a comment on there from somebody who would said that they almost wish they hadn't invested in the life strategy funds because they're obviously sitting on a loss and they wish they stayed in cash. I mean, that is the benefit of hindsight. I mean, that is just the way investing is. If you aren't happy with possibility of losing money and getting back less than you put in, then investing really isn't for you. But just to give you some numbers, up to the start of July, so the first half of 2022, if you'd invested in the Vanguard Life Strategy 60% equity fund, you'd be down 10.95%, so call it 11%. If you've been invested in the 80% equity equivalents, it's going to be 80% in equities and 20% in bonds, you'd be down 10.35%. So it's broadly the same. So just to recap for people who don't know, if listen to this podcast. Vanguard is obviously a huge entity. It's one of the, if not the biggest fund manager now in the world, and they run a lot of passive investments. And the life strategy funds, which they run, are hugely popular. They've got billions of pounds in, and they provide a diversified mix of global equities and global bond exposure. Now, there are five funds, and they are differentiated by their equity content. So 20% equity exposure, 40%, 60%, 80%, and 100% equity exposure. And the balance of that is obviously invested in global bonds, as I've mentioned. Now, they are the darling of the passive investment world. So if you hear people who go online, you might see them on Instagram, and they tell you that basically just pump your money into Vanguard, you almost can't lose. Now, they are very good funds, and they have performed really well. But what I want people to have is a bit of realism and understanding as to what they're investing in because just like any other investment that you have not every investment can go up indefinitely and you almost get this sense where people talk about oh well how's it doing against the life strategy funds if they talk about any other fund or uh, approach to investing and almost this is seen as almost a holy grail and what we've had is a prolonged period where the life strategy funds have performed very very well so to give you some insight the 80% equity version of a life strategy fund, if you go back over 10 years, has returned 139%, which puts it fifth in its sector. Now, the sector in habit is the mixed investment 40 to 85% shares retail sector, basically a bunch of funds that have around about 60% equity exposure, but it's between 40 and 85. So that one lives in there. And 
it's fifth out of 119 funds in that sector. Yes, it does have a quite a meaty equity exposure. So it's at the top end of that investment risk in that sector. The other fund that's actually in the same sector is the 60% equity version. And over the 10 year period, that's 35th out of 119. So that's still pretty good. Now, if you look at quartiles, which is the sort of top quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, if you listed them from top performer to bottom performer, then the 80% equity is in the top quartile and the 60% equity is in the second quartile over 10 years. So that's good. If it's in the second quartile, it means it's above average. And obviously, it's quite a way above average. So they are good funds over the long term and they have done well. But this is where I want people to understand how they work. Because the Vanguard funds have a static allocation, which are rebalanced regularly. Now, in this strategy, depending on which fund you have, because that would dictate the equity exposure, the way that Vanguard runs them is a quarter of that equity exposure is put in the UK, while the rest is in overseas equities. Now, on the bond side of things, 35% of any bond exposure is allocated to the UK, while the rest is global. Now, what is important is that if we look at the asset mix of the, let's go with the 60% equity exposure, because that's basically the typical balanced, diversified portfolio, about 60% equity exposure. If we look at that one and focus on that for the moment, that fund has 29.6% exposure to North American equity. So if let's call it 30. So 30% of the fund is invested in US equities. If you compare that to its sector average, then typically funds only hold 17.4% in US equities. So we're almost heading towards the fund having twice as much exposure than its equivalent peers. By contrast, if you look at the UK equity exposure of the life strategies peer group, then this is around 20.3%. And that compares to just 15.5% for the 60% equity life strategy fund. Now, by comparison, if we talk about the 80% equity life strategy fund, that has 39.15% in North American equities, let's call it 40, and it has 20% in UK equities. So you can see there's a US bias there. And now I've seen things stating that if you look at the 100% version, it has less US equities compared to, say, the All World Index. But when you look at the funds and compare them to their peer groups, so the other options that people would really invest in on the mixed asset allocation, bond and equities, then they do have a high exposure to US equities. Now, if I picked out which has been the best performing global equity market, the developed one over the last four or five years, it's US equities by absolute country mile. And I touched upon this on a recent podcast. So that means leading to 2022, the life strategy funds have been given a real boost by that overexposure to US equities. Now, actually, from the start of 2022, that unraveled. In this year, US equities lagged at the start significantly, and UK equities performed quite well because of the more exposure to value type stocks and things like oil and gas producers and less tech exposure as well. So that underweight in UK versus its peers in equity terms and the overweight in US equity terms hindered the equity part of the life strategy funds. Now, not only that, you've got to bear in mind that the equity exposure of a life strategy fund is unhedged. Now, when I say unhedged, I'm talking about the currency exposure. So if you own an asset overseas and the currency exchange rate moves, it impacts the value of that asset. So let's say you have a US share and the value of the pound plummets, then the value of that share that's denominated in dollars actually goes up in pound terms. So what we've seen since, say, Brexit, when do you remember when we used to have the pound above $1.40? We are now below $1.20. So that is a currency kicker. That boosts the returns of the life strategy funds because they've got a little bit more US equity exposure than most of its peers. So it therefore gets that currency kick there. It's worth pointing out that its bond exposure is hedged. And the reason it is because Vanguard take the view that the bond part of a portfolio should be the stable part. So they actually hedge out the currency exposure on that part of the portfolio because that actually costs money as well. So it starts to detract from returns when you hedge out currency exposure. And it's quite difficult to do it on equities anyway. So what that means is that if you get a period where, say, the pound starts to rally against the dollar, that will hurt the life strategy funds. And so if we see that, if we start to see a bounce from the lows that we're at now, and suddenly the pound rallied for some reason, then that will hurt the life strategy funds, which have that US equity exposure. The other thing to bear in mind is that when we look at the bond exposure on life strategy funds, the duration is quite long. So if you go back to 
episode 365, I talked about index linked guilt and the duration issue with them. And if you look at other Vanguard bond funds, you will see they like duration. And what that means in simple terms, when bonds fall in value, if you hold something that's got a long duration, then that is amplified. If they rise in value, the opposite is true. Your profits will be amplified. Now, over the last decade or so, when we've had QE, bond yields have tumbled. That means bond values have rallied. And of course, if you've got this kind of amplified exposure to that asset class, then you will benefit greatly. What we've seen in 2022 is when equity markets tumble, particularly US equities, and then we saw bond markets completely collapse, particularly US treasuries, then that amplification, that duration risk came home to roost for the life strategy funds. So they tumbled in value and it hurt them. And if you look at the performance of the funds over the last, say, six months, the difference is quite stark. So the 20% equity exposure fund, so that's the one that historically has been quite low risk, that is fallen 8%. That is one of the worst performing funds in its sector, which is the mixed investment 0 to 35% shares sector. Now it's 89th out of 96 funds. And that's because of that hammering, that bond part of the portfolio took. Now, if you move up the life strategy funds, you go to the 60% equity exposure. That is in the third quartile. So it's below average over six months. If you go to the 80%, it creeps above average. And that's because the bond exposure is starting to reduce. It's only got 20%. And if you look at the 100% version, then again, that is in the top half of its sector for the year to date. So the bond exposure has hurt these funds. So the message is not that these funds are bad. They have obviously over the long term performed very well, but it's just that people understand why they are performing like they are. And the reason that is key is because if you are truly going to be investing and you want to buy and hold something for the long term, like the person who commented on our YouTube video, if you get spooked because they start to fall in value, but don't understand why it's happening, then you may just stop investing rather than investing for the long term. And so just saying, I'll buy and forget you shouldn't check or understand. Actually, I don't believe that's true. You should still understand why your investments are moving the way they are, then understand the environment where they could do badly or where they could recover. Life strategy will do well when bond markets rally and when US equities begin to rally again. And we've seen a bit of that in the last month. They've actually started to perform well again, but we don't know what's going to happen going forward. So if you understand why your funds behave the way they do, you understand the biases again, a bit like that investment trust piece I referred to at the beginning, then it stops you from freaking out and perhaps making emotional decisions when you don't need to. Or it may be that you review the situation and go, do you know what? I don't want to be in this investment anymore. I'm going to choose another one. And you could, in fact, choose another passive solution if you wanted to, something that was a track or whatever, but you've made an active decision to do so. And it is your money to do that. So make sure you understand what's going on. And what is interesting is that I'm seeing a lot of those people on social media and things like that starting to panic a bit about their portfolios as people are commenting about losing money year to date. But it's because they don't look under the curtain and understand why. Okay, so let's move on to the final piece then. And this is just an FYI, really, to consumers out there. We all use financial product. And there's going to be some changes in the coming months that hopefully we'll all notice that will make our lives easier. So I'll explain what it is. The FCA announced this week that they've introduced something called the Consumer duty. And what this is, firstly, it's an overarching principle. And the principle states that consumers should receive communications that they can understand, products and services that meet their needs and offer fair value, and that they get the customer support that they need when they need it. So it's a bit wordy, but essentially what that means is the FCA is saying to financial firms, buck your ideas up, we need to simplify things and we need you to play your part. What they've also done, the FCA, is they've set out a number of rules rules by which these financial firms must adhere to. And I'll read out what those are. And actually, this should make all of our lives much easier going forward. So financial firms must, one, end ripoff charges and fees. There's no more details on this, by the way. They are quite punchy short statements. And Damien, you and I perhaps can talk these over on what this actually means in a second. The next one is that companies must make it as easy to switch or cancel products as it was to take them out in the first place. Next, they must provide helpful and accessible customer support and not make people wait so long for an answer that they then give up. 
They must provide timely and clear information that people can understand about products and services so that consumers can make good financial decisions rather than burying the key information in lengthy terms and conditions that few people have the time to read. And the last two are that firms must provide products and services that are right for their customers. And finally, they must focus on the real and diverse needs of their customers, including those in vulnerable circumstances at every stage in each interaction. So that's quite punchy stuff from the FCA. They're making it quite clear there, Damien, that they want changes to happen and have set out the first set of rules by which companies need to do this. Now, the time frame that the companies need to do this by is 12 months from now. They must adhere to these rules on all of the products and services that are in existence for existing customers and existing products. They then have a further 12 months to apply this set of rules to any products and services which are no longer available, no longer able to buy. So they can go back through their back catalogue of products and services and ensure that those rules are met for those as well. So, I mean, what do you think of that? I'm quite excited by it. I am pleased by what the FCA has done. Now, at the moment, it's kind of like a wish list. It's thin on detail, but it's quite heavy on the direction of travel and what they want. So some of those things is almost like the FCA had been listening to us the podcast and some key things that I really am excited about. One of them, which is a real annoyance of mine and something we talked about in the podcast that I've always believed that you should be able to cancel products as easily as you sign up for them. And that is because lots of companies, not just in the financial services, get you to sign up for something and then in order to close it down, they make it deliberately difficult. So that isn't just something that is unfortunate or by accident. In some instances, especially even new companies that have got great technology, they do make it more difficult. But that is exciting. And I think that is something that does need to change and it will give consumers greater choice. I like the fact that they listen to the need for different products or diverse products to meet a diverse client bank because the issue we have, and if you go back to the podcast where I talked about the difference between sort of the rich and poor, about the different things that people have access to and how there is effectively a discrimination inbuilt into a lot of financial products. And so I hope that is going to be removed. The communication part I like as well. So there's no reason why we can't communicate by different methods mechanisms rather than being on the phone and waiting in line on a queue why can't we do things on whatsapp or do things much more quickly using modern technology and at the very least it may mean a quite a bit of investment for companies to have to hire people to be available to answer the calls that people are then putting in and so like you mentioned this is really going to be in place from august 2023 in, in essence so i think it's a definite positive move in the right direction but the only thing that concerns me about it is that it's thin on detail and it all depends on the regulator being very heavy-handed and fining companies if they don't adhere to it. If it's a case that here's the rules, you're not following them, naughty, naughty, tat, tat, and nothing really changes, then that would be a huge disappointment. But potentially, I think this could be a real big change of direction. And for consumers in the financial world, hopefully getting rid of all the jargon and the lengthy T's and C's or having things hidden in there, it's always going to be a positive. So if the FCA takes it, runs with it and finds people, then I think that could be something that we would be excited about going forward and could make a real big difference. But the reason why we really wanted this on the podcast is because this is the sort of thing that you need to be aware of because you can start to wave it in front of companies. When we get to this time next year, you need to know that this is coming. You can start to say, hold on, you're not adhering to this. When you make a complaint about something, you can then use that and say, well, you're not adhering to the FCA's consumer duty. And I mean, when I've made complaints about various things, not just in financial services, but other areas, if you start to pull up regulation and put it in your complaints, it makes it much more powerful and they start to move and take action because they don't want a complaint to go further and even to the ombudsman as well. So a positive step. Let's see what happens this time next year. Yeah, I think it'll be well worth an update this time next year to see uh, what the news is then and what companies have done. Maybe give some examples. And like you say, something in your back pocket for if you've got a complaint, perfect opportunity to bring that up. Right. So that is it for this week. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so in the usual way. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Please do review the podcast. As we said before, if we read it out on the podcast and you've got every 
every chance of winning a Money to the Masses mug. Do make sure you follow us on our socials. If you do nothing else, please pop over to Instagram. Just search for Money to the Masses. We are working tirelessly to make sure that that Instagram is everything that you need in bite-sized chunks that you can save down. And we're getting loads of great feedback on it. So please do follow us on there. So Damien, that is it for this week. Until next time. Until next time. Oh,